Thank you, Daniel. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here because, as Daniel mentioned, I spent 10 years of my life working on the design and the construction of the 9-11 Memorial and Memorial Museum. And when I first thought about what I wanted to talk about today, I thought, well, security, I want to talk about the ways we made that place safe, the way we could help as architects or engineers make public spaces safer. And that was a big part of the 9-11 Memorial site. This is uh, the plaza that sits above the museum. It's a beautiful, it's a serene space. And what you're not seeing is in every one of those light poles, there's a security camera that the, underneath the grass is a hardened concrete slab that resists blast, that you're surrounded on all the perimeter by vehicle barriers, and that there are people there who are providing security, but they're also providing you with assistance and information. And so really what most of what you're experiencing in terms of keeping yourself safe here is something that you're not seeing and you're not, it's not visible. And despite that, we still had to confront the issue of, of security in a, in a more conventional way. So you enter the museum, you go through a metal detector. This isn't something we really wanted to do. It's something that actually we had to do. And we were worried this is gonna change how people respond and feel when they get to the site. And I think it turns out, for good or bad, no one really comments, no one really notices anymore. I think it's become such a part of what we expect and anticipate when we fly, when we travel, and certainly when we visit a site like this. So the more I thought about it, I didn't really want to talk about, about cameras or technical security. I thought what's really more important is what was our challenge here at the site? And it wasn't necessarily making people fearless. I think at a place like 9-11, like Ground Zero, accepting fear, accepting our vulnerability, those are very genuine and honest responses to the site. We need to accept that and understand when people come here, they're feeling that way, and there's a reason. And they are feeling, they have a very emotional attachment to this site. And it's odd to understand you know, why, because in many ways, these were two office buildings Yet for some reason, they were important to us. When they fell down, there was actually a cry to rebuild them exactly the way they were. And this is a model from up to year 2005. They wanted them to be there again. So why was it, what was it that attached us to these places? And I think it's something beyond just architecture. These were imprinted on us from an early age. These are buildings that we saw on television. We saw them as movie sets. We saw newscasts. We saw these events such as Philip Petit crossing the towers. And whether we lived in New York or we were a visitor, you know, we often went there ourselves. We went to the observation deck or we had memories of going to the restaurant or going to a party. And so they became something more than just architecture and buildings. They became part of our city and they actually were icons. What's interesting is that actually before 9-11, I don't think people really loved these buildings. It was only after they were gone that we realized that we really missed them and that they were something, something about them. So you come to this site and you're unsettled. You're not comfortable. You know that there's something happened here that is difficult. And what were those emotions? What, what do people bring here? Well, it turns out I think they really emerged very quickly after September 11th, and we saw that in what people did spontaneously. This site was probably first and foremost a place of loss, tied ever so much tied to the 3,000 people who died here. But it also became a site of remembrance, that we somehow felt we needed to remember what was there we, it just was important to us, and this is the Towers of Light, the, one of the first memorials that emerged spontaneously or with, within the first years of 9-11. And then, slowly, Daniel alluded to this, it became a site of resilience, something that spoke to survivorship, to perseverance, to faith, and to rebuilding. So there are plenty of sites in our history. You can think of Pearl Harbor, you can think of Gettysburg, that are important parts of our national heritage and that were sites of tragedy. Why is 9-11 different? Well, obviously it's more recent. It's only 15 years, it feels like yesterday to some of us. 
but it's also something that we never woke up and read about the next day. It wasn't something that happened remotely. For many of us, it's something we actually watched in real time, um, which is something that's it's very unusual now, and it really imprints upon us that day and our, and our own feelings, those sort of waves of, of shock and disbelief. And it wasn't just us in New York or the United States. It was something that the world saw because we are in this digital world. It's a different place and it's probably something that more people than you ever would imagine could have seen up till now. And it's something that we see when visitors come to the site. This is something that's part of their life as well. So how do we navigate between a desire to provide comfort and yet this unease that's just a genuine and honest part about coming to this site? What does this mean in a museum where you're also trying to tell a story, you're trying to be part of the historical record? And I think what we ended up realizing was by confronting and accepting the fear and the emotional connection that we have, we can actually create a much richer experience at the museum and a much more personal one. This isn't going to be, and this isn't like a museum anywhere else where you go and you buy a ticket and you check your coat and you walk right into an exhibit and you learn about an event. You're coming here with much more information, much more emotion and much more history. So what were these emotions that we were trying to understand? Well, I think that first and foremost, you have to go back to what did we get to experience when we started this museum project. We started designing a museum in 2004. That was three years after the event, and in that first year, they cleaned out the site. They hadn't left a shred of the existing buildings. We had this large 16-acre void in lower Manhattan. And we've noticed something which really sort of, in a way, surprised us, which is that people were coming here, and it was probably one of the most visited parts of New York, and there wasn't a memorial, there wasn't a museum, there wasn't anything, but there was a sense of authenticity that people were drawn here, that there was a power to this place, and that, so that's something that we really could respect and had to respect. We also noticed that people responding to just the size of this, this huge excavation, that somehow it symbolized to them the enormity of our loss, just the scale of that loss. And yet at the same time, in that large void, there was that sense of where were we? Where were the towers? They were totally lost. You can see them dotted in in this map, but they were utterly unperceivable to the visitor. And then we learned one other thing, and I learned this on a personal level when I went to visit uh, Hangar 17 at Kennedy Airport. So when they cleared out the site, they collected pieces of bent steel, damaged signs, artwork, rescue vehicles, fire trucks, and they, these ended up in museums around the country. But they put them in a warehouse in an old empty airplane hangar, and they just rolled, there was just rows and rows of this. There was no text, there was no explanation, there was no sequence. So, but you could walk in, and all of a sudden, you just became speechless, and I actually started to cry my first time there. Because these things were speaking to me in some way, that they were reaching me, and they didn't need to be explained. They didn't need somebody to tell me what happened and who was there, I just somehow knew what they meant to me. And that was one of the most powerful lessons we learned, which is that you're, there's an ability for artifacts to connect to people without necessarily over-intellectualizing them, over-narrating them, that we needed to somehow preserve that, that raw, authentic reaction, which was so much part of those first days. So how do we tackle this? How do we weave emotion, memory, personality and personal experience into that historical record. So I think to do that, we really looked at what was it about this place that was important. And the first thing we looked at was scale. This is what you saw in the years 2002 to 2005. It's gone now. There are two new skyscrapers. There's a third one being built. There's a park on top. There's a train station. This isn't here, but this was what people saw and reacted to. This is what told them that this was a big event, that this was a, a, a big hole in our lives, and that there were features about this site, like the slurry wall, which you see in yellow, which were metaphors for our, our own survival. The slurry wall 
was the part of the site that actually resisted the forces of the lateral forces of the Hudson River and the groundwater, and it was something that actually survived despite all the damage. So he said, we need to keep this as part of the memory of the site. And we were able to actually preserve a lot of that original excavation, but more importantly, to preserve that character, so the, the rawness of the concrete, the slurry wall, so that you come in today and you still get that memory, that, that reaction, that same feeling we saw visitors come to the site with. Then we asked the question about the towers. Now, this was that question everyone asked us. Where were they? Where were they? They felt it was important to remember. And partly they were remembering sort of these buildings that were totems on the skyline. And we were sort of fortunate because we actually found out something, perhaps unintentionally, but when they cleared out the site, they took the structure down to the bedrock level and then they cut off all the columns. And it turns out that they left these columns that created these squares that were actually the edge of the towers. And we said, now we have a place and an opportunity to connect people to actually those footprints where people were. And we were able to uncover them and we were able to light them. And now people can go down and they can see where the buildings were. But it became something else because at first we thought, okay, the buildings are something that we remember, we want to know. But then we started talking to the family members. And it turns out that the buildings were more than just archaeology, that they symbolized something sacred and powerful to them. Because most of the people who died on 9-11, they died in the North Tower or the South Tower. And the edges of those towers created a, a footprint or a space that was in a way sacred, because that was a boundary between life and death. And so with the family members' input, it became very important that those edges became honored. They became thresholds. We put some of the most sensitive, important parts of the museum on those footprints. And they became actually more than just memory. They became, in a sense, a an, homage, an homage to the people who, who passed away. So that meant that we now had that, once again, that connection, that physical connection. We're, we're preserving this idea of looking down into the site. But because the footprints are now 70 feet below ground, we have a challenge. How do we get people to come down 70 feet? And we don't want to put them in elevators or escalators because it's really important that this is a sequence and a journey of power and solemnity. And so we came up with this idea of bringing people down very gradually and letting them look into this, this big excavation in a way that was very similar to what we had once experienced. And it, it sort of dawned on us that we remembered what it was like when we first came down to that hole in the years 2004 and 5. So it was that part of the, the recovery of the site, they actually excavated and they built a 70-foot deep ramp. Mostly for, it was for vehicles, it was to take equipment, debris, in and out. And this became the way we walked in and out of that site every day we wanted to visit and look at things. And we noticed something when we walked down this ramp, that, that we were changing, that we were leaving this world up at the top, this bustling world of the city, and we were coming into a different world, a different environment, a place of solemnity, a place of respect. And it was the timing, it was the pace, it was just the, even the deliberateness of walking down a ramp, that's something you don't do casually. It changed us, and we thought, this is what we need to do for people. And not only do we need to do this to help them make that adjustment, it gives them the time and the chance to reconnect. And this ramp, this route, actually is something that becomes more than just a way of getting down. It becomes, in a sense, a procession or a route of honor or homage. And in fact, every 9-11 in those first years, it was the way people came down at the annual ceremony on September 11th. And so we were able to to really, I think, recapture that sense. And then taking the lessons we learn from visiting the hangar is that you walk into this museum and you're not gonna see a lot of information. No one's gonna explain anything to you, but you will see a few things and you'll understand what they are. They'll reach you, they'll connect somehow to what you can remember. And more importantly, there's the time and there's the space to remember who you are, where you were, what this all means to you and actually see contemplation and recollection and reflection as part of learning and experiencing a place. So we think in the end, this is the last place you see. It's actually the first thing you see from the overlook. It's the last, it's the thing that comes closest to what we thought of and what we saw in the very beginning. 
So it gets back to ultimately, you know, what is my message? What is this really telling us? It's a very complicated topic today and you're hearing such a range of ideas and opportunities. And I thought about it and I think what I'm learning from this is that maybe there's a more nuanced view of what it is to be fearless. Maybe it's okay to embrace vulnerability, that security isn't always completely being free from fear. You know, when you visit, you know, 9-11, you're going to sort of experience these kinds of conflicting emotions. These are things that are part of the human condition. You're going to feel vulnerable, but you're going to feel proud, you'll feel sad, you'll feel hopeful. And what's important is that you look around and you'll see that in everyone else with you, in all the other visitors. You'll recognize that in their eyes. And I think that by seeing that, you're recognizing that we, that we share this common condition, that we share these, these bounds and these values, and that we're part of a community. And I think that seeing that is probably the most powerful message in the end that we can give people who come to this site of tragedy and remembrance. So thank you.